Hi guys, and welcome to the Shifted Cinema Podcast, a podcast about movies and experiences. My name is Holland Rains, and I'll be your host for this evening, or afternoon, or morning. And I guess that's the, the really cool thing about podcasts, is that you can listen to this whenever you want. Before we get started with today's brief discussion, I thought it might be beneficial for you guys to learn a little bit about me, since you'll be listening to my incoherent ramblings if you decide to stick around, as well as my goals for the podcast. I'm a filmmaker from Cincinnati, Ohio, with a background in video production and media studies, and I've always loved movies. Now, this can be traced back to the ripe age of six when I first saw Raiders of the Lost Ark. It was one of those really odd, sublime moments of my childhood, because it was the first movie I had seen where I realized, oh shit, I I can do this for a living in the future. And ever since that moment, I've been working towards becoming a better filmmaker by always being behind the camera and dissecting as many films as I can. Now imagine a montage where years and years go by, my hair becomes a little bit more gray, I'm a bit chubbier and possibly a teensy bit neurotic. Outside of filmmaking, I try to watch as many movies as possible, obviously. And over the past three or so years, I've been trying my hardest to educate myself through the works of other great film theorists, as well as challenging my own perception of what cinema is and can potentially be. But that's enough about me. Let's talk about the podcast for a minute. Why start a podcast? It's a question that many of my friends have asked me when I told them about this endeavor I want to go on. Well, I I could spend my time scribbling chicken scratch into a notebook or starting a blog where I can chronicle my thoughts regarding film. But what I've noticed over the years is that some of the most interesting takeaways about film come from the conversations right after the credits have begun to roll. The spontaneity in these conversations has always fascinated me. And luckily for me, I have an amazing group of friends and colleagues that are willing to share their experiences via the microphone. As far as goals go, what I really want to see from this podcast is to hopefully create a community of film nerds and to give a platform for discussions regarding a deconstruction of themes, character dichotomy, and form, while also having fun along the way and hopefully not being up my own ass most of the time. In future episodes, I hope to get some really cool local Cincinnati-based filmmakers, as well as professors in media and filmmaking, to discuss the ever-shifting world that is cinema, and hopefully shed some new light onto the more unknown recesses of the filmic landscape. If this is a podcast about movies and experiences, then I find it fitting that the maiden voyage for the Shifted Cinema podcast has um, a guest that I've known for quite a long time. He's a fellow that I've experienced many a movie with. And with that, three, two, one, action. So guys, we're here with one of my oldest friends. I met him in the fourth grade. Fourth grade. Do you do you remember when we met? When we met? yeah, it was between yeah. You've heard this. So between me, you, and uh, Danny Glasscock, and I, I chose Holland Reigns. I, I had one best friend to pick. <laughs> And you're like, and those I, are the two I, new guys in fourth grade. So. I don't want the potential future porn star. Yeah, Glasscock like already had his career written out in his last <laughs> name. So from was, the yeah, beginning. Like, I don't know if I want to hang out with that guy. So yeah, I I thought it'd be great to have Vinny on the show because I've known him for so long. He's seen my evolution as a filmmaker and as a as a film watcher, but I've seen the same thing with him. So it'll be a bit of a nostalgia trip. But what we're gonna do is go through. A brief Q&A from some questions that my friends have sent me on Facebook about the podcast, about movies. And there's not too many questions because I guess I'm a bit of a recluse and don't have too many friends. But we'll make it work. You'll be all right. So I guess I should have given this as a little caveat. But for this Q&A, I have cut out the first question, which was, what was the first movie you wanked it to? Sent in from my uh, good friend, Mac. And instead of listening to Vinny and I talk about masturbation for a couple minutes, I'll just leave you with this very small anecdote. 
When I was a teenager, I had borrowed Mulholland Drive from the library for one very specific scene. Uh, take that however you want it. Now back to the show. So yeah, diving into the second question, which I feel has a lot more weight to it. Mac asks... One word answer. Yeah, it's definitely one word. When did you realize that movies weren't only for telling stories, they were telling the audience some sort of message? And I'll start this one off. Yeah, you go ahead. That's a, that's a heavy one to drop on. Oh, it's definitely like, yeah. it's definitely heavy. Um, so there's two movies that come to mind. One of the first is A Clockwork Orange, because I remember watching that when I was, you know, a teenager. And the the use of music, the cinematography, at that point, I don't think I had really seen any Stanley Kubrick movie. Um, but the ending kind of messed me up as a kid because I was like, Oh shit. Oh, he's still like evil. Like all of this, all these experiments didn't really change him. He's still as this, a kid. Yeah. As, as a, as a, as a, as a budding film scholar. Yeah, what, 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 what age? I don't remember. Yeah, I remember it was too really, young to watch the film. Well, I remember it was really awkward because at the time I got it from GameStop and I watched it with my dad. So I was old enough to watch it with my dad to where <laughs> he wasn't telling me I shouldn't watch it, but I could tell he was super But there were a few awkward. scenes where you might be like kind of, Ooh. Oh dude, the yeah, fucking, yeah, the yeah. opening scene singing in the rain. Like we're, I'm sitting there like sweaty, like I'm watching this with my dad. This You're watching is, a woman getting raped with your dad. Yeah, yes, that was yeah. very awkward. But the, the 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 ending kind of stuck with me for a long time. But I think the movie that really changed the way I look at films was Old Boy. Because it was the first... I mean, at that point, I was watching a lot of Tarantino. I was a very typical all-American kid. I thought violence, ultra-violence was super cool. And Tarantino, you know, the, the Res- Reservoir Dogs, Pulp Fiction are like kind of the epitome of cool. But when I saw Old Boy, it was cool. It was a revenge film, but it also had all these deep levels of um, sexuality. How do we interpret that? That we don't see in American cinema very often. We do see a lot of really interesting kind of sexually based stories in American cinema. But with this, with the, specifically with the incest theme that we find out at the end, and then not knowing like um, the the way the end alludes kind of. Oh, does he still actually know that it's his daughter or not? He's mute. We can't figure yeah, out. Yeah, and they completely, you know, that's like total end when we don't know if his hypnotism has worked or not. Yeah, kind of precisely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as, so as it's almost teenager. like what, what you're talking about is that that open end kind of, the open ending kind of deal. Yeah, the is open that what endedness like, to that's it. That's what kind of really made you realize that. Uh, but, yeah. but also a big thing, a big thing was, is I could tell at that time, I guess I was just old enough to realize like, that's not something you'd see in American cinema, especially American Hollywood cinema. That's way too edgy of a topic. Too many people would be way specifically too ter- the incest in the incest element. Specifically the okay. incest. Okay, I mean, yes, we can. Yeah, obviously, we would have films that you know might have an open ending about something big. But when it comes to up, incest, yeah, incest, yeah, that, that's a definitely big taboo in America. Yeah, yeah, and, I, and there was like this weird. I, I still think there's a weird sort of beauty to Old Boy that he to incest. Yeah, to, yeah, to incest. It's amazing. I'm, I'm definitely for incest. I'll, but let me put it on the record, guys. He's running 20, but, but, you know, there's this weird kind of like, yeah, Holland 2016, uh, this weird sort of like poetic beauty to this idea that like he knows it's his daughter, but he's in love with her and he's willing to like put that aside if he is willing. I mean, he, at the end, he looks a fucking batshit crazy. But that really like that, once again, that stuck with me way more than a clockwork orange did. Well, I think what you're saying is almost we, with these open endings, we can almost become storytellers in that we develop our own endings. We can, you know, I can walk out saying like, maybe he forgot. Maybe he went on and lived a happy Which, life. I, I do agree yeah. with you. I do sometimes think, though, that, how do I put this? It's kind of like when Inception first came out. You know, yeah, it's, it's Inception. Inception. Yeah, okay. Inception. Yeah. Great film. But everybody always debating over the ending. And my whole thought is like, why does that even fucking matter? Like, yeah, part of it with Old Boy is the open endedness. A lot of it for me, though, was the incest. Oh, it's like you're you're supposed to see very often. You're supposed to respect the ending for giving you that open endedness, but not spark a debate on what what it really means. And that's another thing with this podcast is I don't want this to be some fan theory bullshit podcast. I don't want to go into like, oh, what do you think really happened when they were there? 
well, does it really, does it actually matter to the subtext of the film? So we like interesting things, not bullshit things. Yeah. Okay. Per, per, yeah. Okay. If you want to break it down layman's terms. Right. Sure. But what about you, Vinny? Okay. So let me understand this question correctly. It's when I realize films weren't just for storytelling, but for something more. Possibly or? like maybe when you realize that films weren't just um, entertainment, that maybe they were something else. Okay, one thing that really strikes me with films is obviously story, but then also the way the elements in the story are shown, told, in that it can leave a lasting effect on you as the audience, and even perhaps like the emotion going on in the film, let's somehow deliver that, put that on the audience. They're going to feel that emotion. You know, obviously films should strive for that, but you know, there's only a few, you know, few films that, you know, do that fully successfully. One that comes to mind, Requiem for a Dream. And I was actually going to say Lion King earlier because I didn't know how far back we were going, but like I was creeped the fuck out when yeah. Scar was dancing around with the hyenas and stuff. And like, that really felt hellish to me growing up Catholic, but that's a different, that's an outside element. Putting, that's you know, a whole episode movie. within itself. Yeah, yeah. Like, I can do. I can go all day on that one. Uh, I remember when I was little, and my my dad brought the Matrix home, and I remember like, ooh, that's interesting. Well, I remember looking around. Okay, well, this is it's not really the Matrix that I thought because I grew up in a very Christian household. Yeah, just as um, I did. Yeah. Just as you yeah. did. We both had this looming fear of going to hell. But I remember when my dad uh, first brought the Matrix home, and he was watching it in the living room because he never saw it in theaters, and I looked around the doorway and I could see him watching it, but they have that the, the nightclub scene where Rob zombies music is playing. I don't yeah. even know that song, but yeah, yeah, yeah you get what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. But I heard it and I was like, so enticed by it, but I'm like, but that's bad music. I can't. Yeah, like, that's the devil's music. I can't, like you can't that, touch no. that. What was your dad doing? What? Listening to that. Garbage. While he was watching the movie, oh, but man. I remember telling him, yeah, going straight like, to hell. That, that was what I think fifth, fourth or fifth grade when the matrix came out for us. Okay. And, um, it was so funny. Is so that, real perspective, 2000, 2001, I think 2000s, 2001, I was in or sixth maybe grade. very yeah, late nineties, yeah, yeah. okay. maybe. Um, but yeah, I remember going up to my dad, like, dad, I feel so bad because that song that plays, I really like it, but I know I shouldn't. <laughs> and, and, and I could tell my dad was even like a little, my dad's pretty religious, but I could even tell he was just like, it's okay. Hey, that's it's okay, cool. But... You're going to son. I'm right. teaching you some stuff, man. <laughs> yeah. I could just tell he was like, it's okay, bud. You're, you're not going to go to hell for listening to a song. <laughs> but, um, okay. But so, yes, yeah, so on, on the back question, on track. yes. <laughs> Requiem for a dream. If you haven't seen it, we just see different levels of addiction, just spiral out of control for a few characters. And this, the, the weight of the depression I felt after I watched that film, like at the end, like seeing how it doesn't end well for anybody, pretty much the weight of depression you feel like, I guess I was just at the right age to really understand that. Mm -hmm. And like walking away from that, wanting to tell everyone about how good the film was, but at the same time, how depressed it's going to make you feel like I wanted to, I, I needed people to know about the film pretty much after I saw it. And that I had never felt like, that way about a film before. So I'd say definitely, yeah, Requiem for a Dream for me. I remember when um, that one. Yeah. We, that, that was, uh, yeah. how old were we when that one came out? Do you remember? I don't even remember when it came out. You might have even told me about it before I went and bought it. I don't, I don't even well, remember, I remember that when I saw it, how long after it came out that I saw it. Well, I remember when we watched it, you had rented it or something because we watched it like three times in one weekend at your place. Yeah, no, I, I definitely remember that being one of those movies, too, where I was so intrigued with the style as well as the substance of the film. Yeah, yeah. Sty it, like, I think even, yeah, style-wise, still held the most, obviously, um, the musical score, that, you know, that that uh, Winter Overture, I, I couldn't even tell you who the original artist is, but that became, like, a phenomenal staple music piece to, to, you know, it's, like, you know, used in, like, YouTube parody videos of not even just the movie, but, you know, so many things. It just, the music in the in the film carried such a depressing tone. It was just everything that in that movie was just set, like, bam, emotion is depression. Deal with it. That's what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it just, you know, kept, kept pounding it in. Oh, yeah, it was, it was definitely an interesting experience um, watching that 
at yeah we were both just at the right age yeah that's what i'm saying I, like it's it's like i feel like this this question asked to anybody it's definitely going to depend on their age at the time what where they're at when they're coming up to which is yeah. i always find that really interesting when i do talk to people that are when i say a bit older i'm talking more like 50s or 60s to see what their takeaway yeah, is yeah i got you um because uh one thing i think is really interesting and i hope to have this on a future episode is when I've uh, talked to my girlfriend's dad, Steve, and he talks about like remembering exactly when Chinatown came out and like watching Chinatown in theaters. Yeah, and, and so like, we, it, we can't even yeah touch that feeling. Oh yeah, much, which is yeah. so which is so funny because I have so much admiration for that film, and I, you know I re- recently rewatched it last summer as an adult, having never really seen it as an adult, and just going, holy shit, this movie's like so tight. I still need to watch that. Oh, uh, I'm surprised yeah. you haven't. But he had a lot of interesting takeaways because that was, um, his whole thing was the subtext is all about the Watergate scandal and all this. And I was like, whoa, you would really have to be living during that yeah, time. Exactly. To yeah, exactly. For that. historical context. Yeah, that would, yeah. Very interesting. So next question on the list, another one from uh, Big Mac is... Most fucked up movie you've ever seen. But I want to break this down into two separate categories. So most fucked up movie you've seen from a visual standpoint. That's stuff that's more gross out, whatever. Visually Visual, horrific. Visually horrific. Okay. Um, and a lot of times, I know for me, sometimes visually horrific doesn't really do much. And the second category is the more kind of existential or esoteric kind of fucked up. Like something that really messed with your head inside and out. I will say when we watched Good Night Mommy last year, the scene where the kids the lips, go, the lips, yes, where they glue no, her I lips see shut. That. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll just throw this out there now, and I'm sure you guys heard it in the prologue section where I was talking. Spoilers for any movie will get dropped in this, so don't expect. Oh yeah, look. I was gonna say. Let's. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, before I don't I've even, even well, said I don't any movies, want, let's throw some spoilers. I don't even want to like put out spoiler warnings like just go into this thing just an overall like hey if we talk about a movie we might say a lot of shit that happens yeah in the film. yeah gotcha. um but yeah no good night mommy the the lips getting uh uh glued shut no that was as really well good because i wasn't thinking more recent i was trying to think like old stuff but yeah yeah no, but that that, also that was when really they, good when they cut her stomach open and all of the cockroaches came out i don't know why i've always had a big kind of like With i don't want to say mommy yeah but that was in like a weird sequence. It was like in deal. a dream okay, sequence. Yeah. Also, I mean, that movie just had a lot of really fucked up, uneasy imagery. No, but it's almost like, I don't know if I'm going into this just with a specific mind, but when I see something like that and then it becomes, you find out it's a dream sequence. I'm almost still like, you know, like sort of like the people that are disappointed when you find out that the end, it was like, Oh, it was all a dream. It's like, uh-huh. Oh, then all of it made no sense. So I don't have to worry about it. It's almost like when I found out something is a dream sequence in a movie, like, yes, it might have still served its purpose, but it, uh, I'm almost not as uneasy to it Yeah, to find out that even in the universe of the movie, it was just a dream sequence. It, like, it didn't actually happen in that universe. So it almost makes it even easier to deal with, I guess, when I look at it. Obviously, that's all up to yeah. the, the person's interpretation. For me, it's, it is just like select images that'll kind of like make me a little... Specifically, visually, seeing it. Is what you're saying. In like, some cases, like when, going oh yeah. back to good night, mommy, when they slice her stomach open and the cockroaches come out, I have a weird thing about cockroaches and mice. I know it's like kind of dumb to be afraid of those things, especially when it's like, yeah, we live next to the woods. You know, you had a mice that like what? 2014 winter. You had a mouse. Yeah, her name there? was Shirley. <laughs> yeah, Shirley. That's why I didn't trap her. I named her. <laughs> <laughs> no. Hopefully she's still kicking. I haven't seen her this winter. I have bad news, bud. Oh, um, fuck. <laughs> Yeah, but like those things, like really, just kind of creep me out. There's like a weird, like kind of abject fear that kind of creeps in, and I, I just don't know what to do about it. Um, I will say, existentially speaking. Well, let, or, let me say something on that with okay. Goodnight Mommy. So you were talking about yeah, cutting her open and the roach is coming out. Now, for me, it was actually when they had already spoiler, when they had already super glued her lips shut. And then cut them open again. Oh, and yeah. And there was blood. Like, that fucks me up for some reason. Like, like if it's a... It's, it's really funny. It's my, almost like a pain that I can visually watch and see and almost imagine. Yeah. I guess, like, that's what really... Like, that's what, like, it's not like I'm going to freak out in a theater, but that's what really, like, gets under my skin. It's just like... Or, like, it even feels good, like, as a movie watcher. Like, if they can do something on screen, such as, you know, like I already mentioned, feeling... 
pain feeling something I can feel as it's going on, even if it makes me cringe. The movie is doing its job if it's made me do that, basically. Yeah, I'd, yeah. I'd much rather uh, cringe at something than uh, jump. Exactly. At something. No, because like, you know, your your cringe is quick, but you feel it a little bit more than just like a jump scare. I, I like, think what yeah, made that it's a scene, deeper level. What made that scene so unsettling as well is just the fact that they're sitting there and were they in masks during that scene? And they're just like watching. Oh her yeah, with it's those like yeah, they, it's masks. just the total emotion, like no yeah, emotion yeah, from you're, them. You're, you're completely like, cut off from it. Yeah, you can't it's like face. you know. Yeah, good night, mommy. It's like how do we just, blame these little boys for what they're doing when they're so emotionless and they think what they're doing is right? But yeah, which yeah, is we have a kind better of understanding how well that movie is written and yeah. directed that we can not just notice those things, but we're able to dissect them. Um, good movie, you should watch it. Yeah, definitely. 10 out of 10 crazy twins. It was kind of funny when I brought that cringe worthy moments. Um, when I brought that movie up to my boss, uh, we were talking about that exact scene and she's like, <laughs> that's the reason I didn't have kids. <laughs> and just like, looks at me like dead, yeah, dead in the eyes. Yeah. That's, and I'm just that's like, what kids do to you. That's, that's the whole point in the film. I tried doing like, it to my dad a few times. I thought the film was actually just one of those training videos about how to raise kids. And she was just talking <laughs> all wrong. And then at the end, like at the, the during, like when we think the credits are going to come up, it's just going to be like, don't do this. And like, you know, we got it. That's like how you parent weird fucking German instructional videos or something. It's in German too. Like, uh, oh, I don't, yeah, I don't know it why was. it was so popular among America audiences i don't know um although i do want to hear your thoughts on the kind of more like up in the air heady fucked upness because i know you had a movie in mind yes and it's one that i've i i struggle with to i i wouldn't call my you know my i i I can never if you told me to pick my greatest you know my my favorite film ever greatest film of all time i'm not going to be able to tell you one like it's when people ask me that question i'm just i'll give them several films but this film might be among that list, depending on who I'm talking to. And the film is Antichrist by Lars von Trier. 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 Trier yeah. Den- Denmark is where Denmark. he's from. The Danish so, filmmaker. The Danish. Yes. Yes. So we, Trier, Lars von Trier. Okay. We'll talk it's about It's actually kind of funny because. I keep saying it. For, yeah, for yeah. some of the listeners out there, this is the technically the first episode, but I've already recorded two. And Hell yeah. in another ep- um, the episode that's going to be coming up next week where I talked to my friend Christian Wood, we had the same problem trying to pronounce his last name, not knowing if it was well, like what Tr- or Trier. I forgot how it got brought. Oh, we talked about Melancholia for a second. Oh, okay, and you have still haven't seen it, so you need to see that. I actually have seen okay. it. Okay. I finally watched it. Oh, hell yeah. Dude, Did I've like been it? watching movies like fucking crazy recently. Anyways, getting into Antichrist. Okay, I'll talk to you about Melancholia later. Yes, Antichrist... It was the first film to almost, I've already said fuck enough, but it (laughs) literally, it fucked me up on a psychological level for days after, days after I saw that film. Like, you really can't grasp exactly what all happened. Like, what is going on? The imagery in that movie is so haunting. Yes, you know, like that slow motion shot, the slow motion shots he uses, obviously he kind of dabbles into that mythology without breaking it too much to still keep it like basic to everybody. And even the fact that uh, the, the characters have no names, him and her are credited. That's it. You know, him and her, they, they have no names. So just the... I mean, there was a sexual atmosphere to that film. By no means was it sexy. Like, you're not going to, you know, wank, like our previous question. You're not going to wank to this film at all. You, if anything, you're not going to want to do it for, for a long time. But that, it, it's almost, I think the sexual element of that film, though, is what makes it so haunting and, and disturbing. Like Yeah, it, the, and I'm not, um, I'm not too clear-headed on Antichrist because I don't really think I've seen it since it, like, first came out. Mm. Um, but I know the one thing that messed with me was a lot of these weird religious allegories that the woman kept bringing up about like the like woman being evil and i always thought that was really fuck like it, it really fucked with me because i was like wow like she knows she's evil yeah should we give it like oh, somewhat fuck. of a synopsis um no if you haven't seen it just go okay, watch if it you haven't yourself. seen it <laughs> yeah, we, yeah we should all right let's keep it weird like because that's how you're gonna feel when you watch it it, yeah, it, it is weird you'll definitely it, feel very from my perspective it's very good it did 
but to me, a very good movie is one that messes you up on an emotional level for a while. Like it, it like, and going back to the question, like it has done its job. It, if it has changed you emotionally. Yeah. The best movies, definitely the ones where for days after you're constantly just reworking scenes in your head, trying to either, if not figure out what it means, you're just still like, possibly uneasy it, yeah or, it almost brings you to that Im, impossible to reach balance that you know we all want to have just it almost becomes balance. like a like a really weird like sublime moment yeah it's like, like you're gonna judge it off of your experiences but at the same time look at it as experiences i have nothing to do with or like maybe i don't know as much as i know about film or what this film is trying to tell me and it, it just it, i think it brings you closer at least to that balance maybe yeah. The impossible balance. D- definitely. Um, so my film in that, in the second category of the more esoteric, um, fucked upness would have to be under the skin. Now, okay. You weren't able to finish that. I was not able to finish it. I was very tired. It is definitely not a movie but, you watch when you're tired. Yes. It, it's very but slow. From what I remember the parts where we are really supposed to feel and be fucked up was pretty extreme like it, it hit hard like at some point well, i was remembering like what i loved about oh like, my god the way that it hits hard too is that it's never overly violent but it's this no uh, it's like it's that, this weird it's this weird duality of the predator predatory nature of this woman stalking men taking them into this house into this into this very weird like creepy ass house that becomes this black void they walk into water and then those men disappear. So we're seeing this interesting dichotomy of like the woman being the predator, but at the same time she's sort of soulless and trying to become human. But then as the movie wraps up at the end, at the, at the end of the film, she becomes the prey and a man ends up killing her and rips off her skin to find Hmm. out she's a robot and whatnot. But it was, but yeah, also we, we see what, what we actually visually see is almost what we can't visually grasp is that we visually see the almost emotional aspect of it. We don't actually see the and, physical side and I don't of it, know if, which, you know, if, I know if you, you, did, in, you didn't get as, you didn't get very far. Yeah. There is a, there is a later on in the film. One of the guys she gets has, um, some sort of, uh, facial problem, but kind of like the elephant man. I can't remember what that, uh, what that term is called. For, Elephantitis. Is it elephant? <laughs> Well, fuck me, right? Um, so <laughs> elephantitis, but uh, you can tell that's the first point in the movie where she starts to try to understand what it means because the whole film oh, yeah, is her you trying to understand up, yeah. what it means to be human and the human experience as well. If we want to dive into like feminist theory, like the female experience, and that's like the first person she kind of is around where she's like trying to kind of like she she's trying to dive into him. And or like it's really it, fucking it, it weird made something that made him abnormal to what she had already had. Well, well he yeah. knows he's abnormal and he's kind of wondering like, what the fuck is this like super hot lady doing talking to me? And when they finally get to the black void yeah, where he's just like looking at her and, and like nothing's really, really uh, yeah. that, that movie left me. So it always uh, ended with that black void. That black, they'd they'd fall into like the the black well, like water. Every every one of our encounter would end with that. And they right? d- they deflate like a balloon, uh, for yeah. lack of a better term. Yeah. But uh, yeah, no, that movie for day, especially the ending shot where you see her on fire, a wide shot in front of these trees burning, and it just pans up, and you see the smoke just drifting into like the the cloudy sky. It just it, it kind of fucked me up for days to where I was like, I really wanted to watch it again. That shot specifically, the idea. Oh no. What, the, what, the whole, what? the whole ending sequence okay. where she becomes the prey. And I'm okay. You know when I'm saying predator? It sounds weird because it sounds like she is maliciously going after people. Like she enjoys it when she's more of a robot. So I think that kind of covers it for this brief Q and a, um, but this is what I want to ask you, Vinny, since you've been my best friend since fourth grade. Right here, baby. And I know <laughs> I know you don't listen to too many podcasts. <laughs> and like I listen to a ton of podcasts, but I don't actually listen to very many like movie based podcasts or film based podcasts, whatever you want to call it. What would you want to see from this show in the future? From this show in the future. Um 
I guess not necessarily. I mean, sort of what we've been doing. Not, not that I'm trying to like toot our horn, but just like we should find things that we think a lot of people don't know about or a lot of people haven't seen and, you know, just not necessarily be like, Hey, go watch this, but like explain why, why is this important? Why, why should we go see this foreign film? Why should we go see this low budget film? Like, you know, look for, look for things that, you know, we feel like it, it, it are doing, even if it's on a low budget spectrum, doing something extraordinary, something that has impacted us hard. You know, we, we are not going to act like we are, the kings of film, but we feel like we are impacted by films and we think other people can be as well. So find, find things that might be hard to find, I guess, and, and get other people on board or to, to at least check it out, see it. And I agree with that. That's actually, um, one of my biggest influences to do this podcast was to not try to talk about whatever the movie of the week is, but to talk about films that I want to talk about. The things- Lion King. The Lion King can do like a whole six part episode on that. Um, And speaking of films that I are and speaking of films that I think are possibly important and stuff that we will be discussing in the future and very recent news, um, the Polish director Andrzej Zalowski died this past week. R.I.P. Yes. Rest in peace. He is known for his 1981 horror film Possession, as well as his 1975 film The Most Important Thing, Love. But he's also known for a little film called On the Silver Globe, which hopefully in the future I'll be discussing with a few friends. It's an extremely interesting film. The aesthetics are just crazy. And the director's known for doing some very crazy kind of out there things. Um but that's a, that's a very recent news. I'm sure if you see the, the date for this episode, you know we're in uh, mid-February right now. But uh, yeah, the, in the, for the future, I have some really cool episodes coming up. I, uh, next week, I'll have my buddy Christian Wood on the show. We'll be discussing a Norwegian film called The Wave, as well as the Academy Awards. The and Wave. Web- yeah, if it was only that metal. Um, as well as the Academy Awards and that they're bullshit. I'll have my one of my favorite people ever, uh, Professor Alexis Polos from Northern Kentucky University, to discuss abject spirituality within Stalker and Solaris, as well as many of other heavy. Yeah, very heavy. I've been working my ass off on getting the show notes together, um, as well as doing um, the the Stalker and Solaris episode is part of sort of like a trilogy of episodes about esoteric sci fi cinema. So it'll be Stalker and Solaris then on the silver globe and then discussing Zardov with my good friend, Mark Borison from the question mark podcast. So which, we're in a cult and we're going to get everybody to join us. Basically. Yes. Okay. That's, that's good. kind of the goal. I'm, I'm going really to make people, to kill a lot of innocent people for no reason. Well, I was, just, I just want to make people uncomfortable by forcing them to watch stuff. They normally would. Oh, okay. Watch. So we shouldn't kill them yet, but, but we're not going to kill you guys yet. 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 Okay. Good. Keyword. Right, yeah. Anyways, guys, thanks for watching. If you have any questions, you can hit me up on Twitter at protofail or send me an email to shifted cinema podcast at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you and uh, let me know what I'm doing right. What I'm doing wrong. Vinny, one, um, one last question for you. Uh oh. Is there any film coming out this year being 2006, Ooh, 16, this year, you're going to run it at me that you're looking forward to. Well, we're about to see the witch on already. Sunday. So, I mean, that's the only thing that I can think that comes to mind is that that looks I mean, just from the trailer in, in, in an impressive display of the film, just from the trailer and that it, we just kind of get glimpses. We, I, I, I couldn't even tell you what the film is exactly Dude, about. You know what? You don't even need to see a trailer for that movie. That one quote from Rolling Stone that says it's like Stanley Kubrick, uh, San, Stanley Kubrick making out with Satan. Yes. I'm sold. I'm sold. No, no, I'm we don't sold. Need else. I just hope that, you know, that's a big quote. I, I think that is amazing. That's what I'm going to look, look for when I go see that you film. Know, the thing, you know, what's really funny too, is I know I'm hyping myself up for this movie a little bit, I yeah, yeah, we I both have this are. I have this good feeling that I'm not going to be disappointed because everything I keep reading in terms of reviews kind of make it out like yeah, this is the kind of horror film I like. I like that really weird unsettling thick atmosphere and it feels like that this is what yeah, that, that that's become do. something that's almost so hard to achieve 
nowadays. Like, you know, horror films are kind of really back and forth. Well, they're I mean, kind of a dime straight, a dozen. Straight horror. Like, you know, horror has become a different kind of, like, almost different people define it differently. It's, you know, that, that kind of I scary, uneasy it, element that we've kind of already talked about. But, I think you know. it's definitely, that's, I mean, that's obviously like a whole topic we could discuss for yeah, like yeah, a obvi- whole hour. Obviously, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's really interesting seeing the, the kind of ever-shifting face of horror but I think what people really do need to realize is that horror is such a broad term. Yeah, I almost think we're still looking for like almost the next big thing. Like found footage, it was a big thing. Yeah, it's kind of had its time. Like we're we're kind of back to cinematic now. That's actually what a, cinematically can we can we bring to mm-hmm. this table to make it new? That's a future. Ep- that's actually another future episode I want to do that I've been doing a lot. I'm of all about on. future episodes apparently. Oh, I've been yeah. just trying to get, I'm trying to give people a little taste. Of what's in the future. I just want to shove it all. I just want to, yeah. <laughs> I just want to give it all to him. Anyways, guys, thanks for watching. Um, Vinny, you're not on social media, so I'm assuming I don't need to give you a spotlight. I'm right not. Now. If people like me, maybe <laughs> I will be. <laughs> this is just me trying to get friends. Uh, don't worry, I'll put you in charge. Be of my the, friend, uh, please. Let Holla know you want to be my friend. Yeah, Vinny needs friends. He's very lonely. Anyways, guys, thanks for watching, not watching, listening. I do too much TV production. We'll Um, film it eventually. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. We'll see what happens. But yeah, thanks for listening, guys. Stay informed, stay cinematic, and keep watching movies.